Good morning and welcome to the worship services of Southern Worship Center of Seven Day Adventists. My name is Pastor Spencer Anderson and it's my pleasure to be in your presence in this virtual worship setting. I pray that you will tune in each week and receive your special blessing as a result of making the effort to participate in a virtual worship service with Southern Worship Center. Well, we begin our worship each week with the affirmation of faith, and this text of scripture shall be led out by one of our young people, and I trust that you will follow along or recite along with him as he uh, leads us in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Let's listen and participate. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They, they shall labor in all thy work, but the Sabbath day, the Sabbath of the Lord I God. In it shall not the word of work. Father, nor my son, nor my daughter, nor my man servant, nor my maid servant, nor my cattle, nor my strangers that's been in thy gates. For the sixth day the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea that's all in them. Wherefore, bless the Sabbath day. Wherefore, Lord, bless the Sabbath day and call it. Thank you. That was Tyler Lewis, who led us in the affirmation of faith, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I trust that you've had a wonderful week and, and a good day so far. And we are now at Southern Worship Center. We are offering services via virtual uh, um, YouTube uh, because of the COVID-19 advisory. And so for today and possibly in the coming week, we will not have in-person services, but we will switch to virtual until the virus threat has passed us by. So thank you for being here with us in this live streaming session of our worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please let your friends and relatives, co-workers know about this YouTube service that's being offered here at Southern Worship Center of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, our clerk would like to share with you a thought in case you've had a difficult week uh, to cheer us up along the way. And so let's listen to Kim as she comes with a special thought that she has prepared and desires of sharing with each and every one of you. Let's listen in. Happy Sabbath, Southern Worship Center. I'm Kim Anderson, your clerk for the week, and I'm here to share a short thought to help you, hopefully help inspire you this week. Our thought comes from Dr. Martin Luther King, and he says that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I encourage each and every one of you to let your light shine and to let the love of Christ show this week. Have a blessed Sabbath. Thank you, Kim, for letting us know the love of God is available to be spread abroad upon this, worth, uh, this earth in which we live in. Certainly struggles and trials and tribulations are part of the, our lives. But, it, but Kim has let us know that the love of God is always there and he sheds his love abroad so that we may be cheered along the way. I hope that this thought from Kim has been a big help to you so far uh, as you're listening in to Southern Worship Center uh, YouTube virtual worship service. Now we, we would like to share with you uh, a hymn known as Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. It's a familiar uh, hymn. I think everyone should know this one. Uh, our guest singer, Navelle Peter, will share uh, this special number with us. And if you feel encouraged, sing along with Navelle as he uh, presents this special hymn as a part of our worship experience on the day. Let's listen to Navelle Peter as he shares a special music number with us.
Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world or my fondest dreams. I have renounced sin and all of its pleasures. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. All my habits of life, though harmless they seem, must not my heart from Him ever sever. He is my all. There's nothing between. Not even my trials, though this whole world against me convene, watching with prayer and much self-denial, triumph at last with nothing between I surrender all I surrender all yes all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all to your will, all to your way, God, everything. There's nothing between, nothing between, nothing, nothing, no, nothing, no. You gave me the victory.
I pray that you were blessed by that special uh, message and song by Nabil Peter. Uh, nothing between, I surrender all. And certainly I would encourage whatever it is that is in bet between you and your Savior today that you will let go and let God because he knows how to handle all of our issues and problems and discouragements, reverses, backups. Uh, Jesus knows how to do it, but we have to surrender our will and our way to him, and then he can handle it. <clears throat> As part of our worship service, we are going to focus on tithing and offering, which is part of worship. There are three ways in which you can participate in tithing and offering at Southern Worship Center. And that is by our website, www.southernworshipcenter.com. And you can click on online giving and it will guide you as to how you can return your tithe and offering. Or you could just mail in your tithe and offering to the church address, 1500 East Barden Road, that's B-A-R-D-I-N, Arlington, Texas, 76018. That's 1500 East Barden Road, Arlington, Texas, 76018. Or you can, uh, when the church doors are open, you can drop your tithe envelope in the locker there in the foyer of the church, and it will be received by the treasurer's department. So either one of these three ways, online giving, mail-in, or physically drop it there at the church inbox. Either way, it will work. and. I, I know that God has a blessing in store for all of those who participate in our, in our tithing and offering uh, portion of our worship. Now let's go to our stewardship department and let's see if we can receive a word of encouragement from our uh, treasurer as she shares with us a uh, insight into how the tithing and offering works and what what benefits are received by faithful parishioners. Let's listen in. It takes many things to keep Southern Worship Center operating, even through a pandemic. It takes keeping the lights on, year-round maintenance. It takes communicating information to us by live streaming, supporting evangelism, Sabbath school, Christian education, and so much more. When you support the church budget, you are supporting all these things and so much more. Thank you for giving joyfully, faithfully, and purposely. Thank you, Ella, for sharing those thoughts with us, those hints as to how important tithing and offering is to God's cause and to the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this earth today. Our scripture, our intercessory prayer now shall be offered and if there be anyone who is sick and anyone who is in trouble, anyone who is perplexed, now is the time to lend your ear and pause wherever you are and participate in this intercessory prayer. As we present before the Lord all of our needs, all our desires, all of our wants, he is a God that hears and he also answers all of our prayers. Let us bow our heads where, wherever we are as we look to the Lord, the great God of the universe to come to our rescue. Father, <clears throat> Thank you for being our heavenly father. Lord, you are concerned about us. And so you've said you can call you our father, which art in heaven. 
Lord, today we are perplexed on every side and there's troubles everywhere. In the political sphere, there is miscommunication, there is misharmony. In the economic sphere, the prices, inflation keeps going higher and higher. Lord, we wonder where it's going to all stop. In the conflict of nations, there's warfare going on in Ukraine and other parts of the world. In the health sector, Lord, there's COVID that is on the loose. It doesn't seem to want to uh, calm down, Lord, and so many people are still being affected by this virus. Oh, Lord, we come to you because we do not have the answers to all these problems and things that exist in our world. We are down here and we have no place to go. So Father, we ask that you will protect us and keep us safe as we come in and out, as we move around. Lord, as we uh, go about our jobs and retail stores and so forth, uh, Lord, we know that there is danger everywhere. There are more guns than people in the United States right now. And so, Father, we just need your hedge put around about us as we go. Watch over our children, seniors. Uh, Lord, whatever the case may be. And so, Father, we pray for those who are sick and shut in, that you may stretch forth your healing hand touch them. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling financially. <clears throat> oh, Lord, we ask that you will give them relief. We pray for those who are incarcerated behind prison walls and cells. Oh, Lord, may the spirit of the living God reach even behind the uh, prison cells. Oh, Lord, whatever the troubles may be, we ask that you will Come to us and speak to us with your still, small voice. Let us know that you are God and there is no other. And so, Father, we present all of these requests before you, and we ask that you will do with it as you see fit, because you are the all-wise God. You know what's best. Now, Lord, bless the rest of our service today. May we receive the blessing we stand in need of, in Jesus' worthy name, let the church say, Amen and Amen. Church, I would like to encourage you to continue to keep praying and looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, scripture reading for today is found in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. This is the first book in the New Testament, and the word of God states like this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where a moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break through and steal, but where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so our message for today is entitled, Where Your Heart Belongs. But before we open up the word of God any further, we shall call on Neville Peter to come and bless us with another uh, message and song. And then I would like to share with you where your heart belongs sermon for today. Let us listen now to Neville as he shares with us another message and song. Well, we'll cue that message and song up at the end. Now, 
let us go right into our message. Seated with the disciples, gathered around him on the shore of the Galilee Sea, Jesus delivered what we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Some call it the Beatitudes. It's found in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. <clears throat> Even though the Greek word describing the location is that of for a mountain, some commentators suggest that the mountain was actually a hill north or west of the Lake of Galilee, where the hills rise steeply from the lake. In this sermon, one writer states, Jesus addresses a Christian's character, who you really are when no one else is around. He's addressing a Christian's influence, those you have the ability to motivate. He's addressing a Christian's righteousness. In other words, our personal right doing. He's addressing a Christian's piety, motivations for my actions. He's addressing a Christian's goals and priorities. In other words, my desires in life. He's addressing relationships, my sphere of influence. He's addressing commitment, my ability to stick to a task. And so when he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break through and steal. But where your treasure is, that will your heart be also. One of the features of this message is the inverse parallelism in verses 19 and 20, where one of the sentences describes the opposite of the other. The word but in verse 19 puts us on notice that what follows is different from what comes before it. If we reduce the phrase to its core structure, we read, do not lay up treasures on earth but lay up treasures in heaven. That's simple enough, isn't it? Don't put all your time investing in the things of this earth, but turn your attention on the things that are heavenly. The almost identical word underscores the contrast between the key words earth and heaven, indicating that the, this passage is really a comparison between heaven and earth. And so Jesus invites us to store up treasures in heaven, not here on this earth. For this earth is transitory, is temporary. And the reason why we should do so is found in the explanation following the word where. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. To help us understand why we should not store up treasures on earth, but in heaven, Jesus describes heaven and earth. He does so quite interestingly in only three words. He uses the word moth, the word rust, and the word thieves. Now, let's take a closer look at each one of these words and see what they reveal. Let's look at the moth. Most of us know what a moth is, right? It is those tiny creatures that can create unwanted new patterns in your carpet or turn your sweater into an unexpected piece of art. As a friend put it, they are the night not quite so cool as a butterfly insect. This is the picture that usually comes to my mind whenever I read this passage. The truth is, 
though, I have never seen a mall. The fact that Jesus spoke of the mall sparks my curiosity about this somewhat evasive insect. And at the study, I discovered some surprising details. Listen to the description of a moth. A moth is an insect related to the butterfly family, both being of the order Lepidoptera. Most of this order are moths. There are thought to be some 160,000 species of moths with thousands of species yet to be described. What's intriguing about moss is that it seems most, if not all, species are pests. In other words, they destroy, they cause problems. You try to get rid of moss. They cause so much damage. They are agents of destruction and not only of carpets and coats, the corn borer and the bollworm caterpillars damage the ears of corn as well as the stalks by chewing the, the tunnels and which cause the plants to fall over. In many parts of the world, they are a major agricultural pest. For there is the diamondback moth which is a serious pest on cabbage and cauliflower and so forth. Caterpillar of the gypsy moth causes severe damage to forests. There is also the cotling moth that causes extensive damage to fruit trees. The larva of tinnadale moths eat clothes and blankets made from natural fibers such as wool silk, fur, and fe uh, feathers. Moths are truly agents of destruction for fruits and vegetables, our food supply, trees, our environment, as well as our clothes, our personal items. What really struck me as I discovered these facts was the breath of harm Jesus grasped in just one word. When he said moth, everybody in the audience understood what he was talking about. He was talking about agents of destruction. Even years after Jesus chose the moth to describe destruction, we still understand exactly what he had in mind on that day. And then Jesus went on to another word of destruction, rust. Jesus also refers to rust. In colloquial language, the term is applied to red oxides formed by the reaction of iron and oxygen in the presence of water or air moisture. Those of us especially living in northern climates are familiar with rust on our cars. I once had a 1962 Nova that had a lot of rust on it. I thought I would get it painted and make it look new, but the rust came right back through again. And so car rust can be a problem, but we don't typically think of it in terms of disaster. <clears throat> rust, however, has the potential to put us in great peril. As the story of the collapse of the Minos River Bridge in Connecticut shows, for it was on June 28, 1983, the bridge fell when the bearings rusted internally and pushed one corner of the road slab off its support. It was all caused by rust. Rust was also an important <clears throat> factor in the Silver Bridge disaster in 1967 in West Virginia, when a steel suspension bridge collapsed in less than a minute. 46 people lost their lives. The bridge failure was due to a defect in a single link. A small crack was formed through fretting wear at the bearing and grew through internal corrosion. The crack was only about 0.1 inch deep when it went critical and it broke a brittle fashion and broke in a brittle fashion. When the lower side of the eye bar fell, 
all the load was transferred to the other side of the eye bar, which then fell by ductile overload. The chain was completely severed. Collapse of the entire structure was inevitable since all parts of a suspension bridge are in equilibrium with one another. After the disaster, the silver bridge was sometimes referred to as a monster of death. In art and literature, rust has been as used as a metaphor for ruin, for decay, for faded glory. Jesus' use of the word makes no exception. The breadth of what he covered in this one word clearly points to decay. We understand exactly what he said, what he was saying when he said, don't let moth or rust decay your things in this life. But there is another aspect to rust. It can also be a plant disease affecting leaves and stems, fruits and seeds. Plants rust are parasites and require a living host such as a plant to complete their life cycle. Cereal crops can be devastated in one season and trees often die due to this. So moths and rust affect our accommodation and, uh, and commodities. It affects our means of transportation. It affects our food. It affects our environment and clothes. This covers a significant part of our lives. Rust. Don't let rust decay your spiritual characters. This is what Jesus was saying. All, then Jesus used another word, thieves. Although condemned in the Bible and prohibited by law, stealing has infested our world with much loss and grief, generating an atmosphere of insecurity and anxiety. Stealing takes place in different ways at various levels and with a diverse range of targets. Individuals, organizations, governments, and nations can all steal. One can seek to appropriate for himself or herself someone else's material goods, intellectual property, or identity. Adultery involves coveting and stealing someone else's spouse. Innocence and dignity can be stolen. We can steal someone else's time, efforts, identity, and talents. We can steal someone's present and rob them of their future. Credit theft is something that's really on the going haywire today. People steal your identity. They use it to uh, open up credit and then they charge up thousands of dollars and leave you on the hook. Again, one word, one, the one concept Je Jesus chose to illustrate the human decay is broad and easily understood. The word describes the condition of the entire human race, and that is selfishness. Thieves do not care about how much pain they inflict. They just want your things, selfishness. It is indeed selfishness that stands at the foundation of sin. Lucifer wanted to steal God's throne. Even Adam and Eve stole each other's innocence and robbed all descendants of God's presence and the peace of a sinless heart. Selfishness has marked and driven the course of human beings who are bound for decay and eventually complete destruction. And so Jesus used these three words, moth, rust, theft, to describe putting up your treasures on this earth. But thank goodness he didn't stop there. For he went on to talk about heaven in contrast. And so let us take a look at heaven. Jesus's words are remarkably rich in content and meaning. 
They are a carefully crafted summary of all the evil on this earth. Natural and moral evil are terms that generally describe two types of evil. Natural evil refers to evil in the material and the animal world not caused by human beings, while moral evil describes the evil caused by humans. In Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Jesus encompasses the reality of all evil thought, three, uh, all evil through three words that represent the three types of evil on this earth. We've talked about the moth representing the animal natural evil. We talked about rust representing the material natural evil. And we also talked about thieves representing human moral evil. In three words, Jesus clearly sums up the condition of our planet with all it contain, contains and illustrates the heart of his teaching. Earthly life is marked by instability, insecurity, saturated with pain of loss and separation. Yet this passage reveals not only the decay characteristic of our fallen planet, but also a solution, an alternative to a perishing world. As one who came down from heaven, the Son of God goes on to weave hope into the reality of the world he just depicted. It is now time to lift our eyes towards the land of the redeemed. It is now time to look up for our redemption is drawing nigh. Looking at the things of this world, if we concentrate on it too much, it can be discouraging, it can be depressing. But Christ has come that we may have life and may have it more abundantly. We often think of the afterlife and wonder what it will be like. Even among Christians who read the Bible, there are various ideas about what heaven is like. Let's see what kind of heaven this biblical passage reveals to us. First, heaven is compared to this earth. It is real and yet distinct from this earth. Have you heard of people say that heaven is what you make of our lives here on this earth? Well, that is a nice way to suggest that being loving, being good, being responsible, doing our lives here can help us make us a little heaven here on our lives and the lives of others. However, heaven is the name for something that is actually real and distinct from this earth. To neglect the reality of heaven and the physical distinction between heaven and earth is to forego much of what the Bible has to say. And so, yes, we can get a little bit of heaven right now, right here in this sinful world, but let us not try to make heaven be anything here on this earth. And then Jesus reveals to us evil or natural or moral, or natural or moral will not exist in heaven. Therefore, no loss. On earth, everything is unstable. Everything is uncertain. It's insecure. It's subject to decay, to destruction, stealing, and loss. Heaven is the opposite. Everything is eternal durable, secure, and imperishable. In heaven, there is no loss. In the past two centuries, the theory of evolution has gained a, a wide acceptance, even among some Christians, I might add. When a Christian accepts evolution, though he or she inevitably agrees that evil existed before the fall, because a Christian who believes in evolution needs to reject the literal fall of Adam and Eve and redefine sin, the, certain, 
the certainty of our future is also dismantled into more options, some optimistic, some pessimistic. But Matthew 6, 19 and 20 points out that evil, all evil, will not characterize the world of the redeemed, of heaven. And so because of sin, evil has come into our existence. But when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be because sin and all of its characteristics will be done away forever. And then Jesus reveals heaven is something we should wish for. Jesus invites us to lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. Heaven is something we should wish for, and only we can choose that for ourselves. It is not something we can give up so others can have it. No, it doesn't work like that. Jesus made provision for everyone who desires. But in these verses, Jesus appeals to us personally. The heaven we discover in Matthew 6, 19 and 20 is a real place distinct from earth where no evil exists, where no loss of any kind will occur. But of what value or relevance would it be for us to know that such a beautiful and happy place exists if we could not partake of it? And so heaven is for real and it is for you. And we must desire to go there. And then lastly, Jesus reveals heaven is possible for your attainment. The most hopeful part in all of what Jesus Thing is that we can have part in this reward. The very one whose hands and feet were pierced with iron nails so we can partake of heaven invites us to lay up treasures where we can, while, while, while we are living here on this earth. But how are we to gather treasures in heaven? We cannot fly there to lay up gold or goods and we don't have a bank of heaven where we can store our money and keep it safe. I'm reminded of R.T. France. He reminds us that heavenly treasures are stored up not by performing meritorious acts, but by belonging to and living by the priorities of the kingdom of heaven. You know, it was a pro pro prophetic writer known as Ellen G. White who fills in the contours of what heavenly treasure means. She says, every opportunity to help a brother in need or to aid the cause of God in the spread of the truth is a pearl that you can send beforehand and deposit in the bank of heaven for safekeeping. She also writes, what shall we do with our time, our understanding, our possessions, which are not ours? but are entrusted to us to test our honesty. Let us bring them to Jesus. Let us use our treasures for the advancement of his cause. Thus we shall obey the injunction, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Sometimes people suggest Jesus' words in Matthew 6 speak against wealth and well-being. The text, however, does not indicate a requirement for us to live in poverty. Rather, the word treasure for many implies, implies gathering, storing up wealth. It suggests a way to create security for ourselves by relying on our own powers and resources. But possessed by our possessions, we discover that we cannot will our way free of possessions. To seek first the righteousness of the kingdom of God is to discover that for which we seek is given, not achieved. Christ is the one who says, I have gone to prepare a place for you. We, can, we had no part in it. We didn't put the idea in Jesus's head. 
it was because of his love that he says, I will prepare a place for you. And if we want to go there, then we need to uh, lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus invites us to walk through this life as people who have accepted the gift of heaven. In conclusion, perhaps you think you are not worthy of heaven. You've been wandering away from God and heaven sounds like a place someone like you could not attain. You are separating yourselves from the shepherd's flock because you don't feel worthy to walk among them. Jesus calls you home. He is calling me, he is calling you. He calls you back, he calls you to be transformed and wants you to accept the promise of heaven. You are renewed in his blood. You are a son or daughter of God and you belong in heaven. Perhaps you've been bewildered by the idea of saying that heaven is not real. You wondered about the meaning of the Bible, questioned the scripture, doubted the truth. Please know that Jesus, in Jesus, there is no deceit. God himself engraved his word for us to remember that heaven is real. Heaven is being prepared for you to take part in when Jesus returns to take us home. Let us embrace this promise. Let us weave it into our goals and let its fragrance enhance each day of your life. Perhaps you have been deprived of material goods that you have worked so hard to attain. <clears throat> I know that Jesus grieves your loss with you. He invites you to trust him and to make him your shelter in the time of storm. He is the God who can renew not only hope, but things as well. Heaven and the earth made new a promise to you, to me, to everyone. And while living with your eyes on the promised future, May the blessings and the wisdom of God be your part in God. And now, maybe this fits your category. Perhaps you have invested your talents in reaching out to others. You have sacrificed in ways that may never have, many have never imagined. Yet your efforts don't seem to be appreciated nor is the reward in sight. And if this be the case, may I encourage you by saying, may the spirit of Jesus move you forward in God's strength, defying discouragement and de deposing of disappointment. Or perhaps the truth of a heaven where beauty is unmarred and joy is endless cannot be grasped through your tearing eyes. Maybe you've lost someone who is very close to you, very dear to you. Maybe you've lost hope for a loved one. Your heart may grow, have grown heavy dealing with sorrows of this life. Then I want to say to you, dear Christian friend, lift your eyes to the sky. Breathe in the freshness of this very moment of life. And may you be reminded that heaven is a place of reunion, of healing, peace. Don't lose faith. Don't lose sight. Don't lose heart. And in so doing, may the peace and the healing of heaven be upon you even in this very moment with strength renewed and hope restored. Matthew 6 21 states, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our hearts belongs to the kingdom of our Father. And that's where your treasure should be sent. Christian friends, where is your heart today? Where is your heart? Jesus says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. 
I want to submit my heart to Jesus Christ. What about you? Let us listen to another song by Nabil Peter as we contemplate our heart returning to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's listen in. Jesus, keep me near the cross, near that precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream that flows. From Calvary's mountain in the cross, in the cross be my glory ever oh, till till my rapture. I hope that this message answered the question, 
where your heart belongs. And Jesus posed this question when he says, lay not for yourselves treasures upon this earth where moth, rust, thieves can break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Christian friends, I believe that is the answer to all of our dilemmas. This world of sin has nothing to offer us, but heartache, headache, Satan comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Christ says, I've come to give you life and more abundantly. And so Jesus in his masterful way of teaching on the Sea of Galilee, some important truths that are still speaking to us today such as such that we can lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth rust thieves cannot break through or steal jesus is talking about your personal life your personal characters what are you doing who are you when no one else is around these are the things that determine where our destiny will lie and so if you are convicted today that Jesus is going to be your personal sin and that the cross of Jesus uh, is shed for your life so that you could have eternal life. Let us bow our heads and look to the Lord guidance and direction and, and spiritual con conviction. Father, we recognize that this world we live in is unstable is unsure, it's decaying, it's falling apart, it's overheating, it's too hot in the summer, it's too cold in the winter. Lord, these are just signs that lets us know it's time for us to start looking for a better place. Oh Lord, you've offered us this and you've said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where nothing can, can destroy it. Not even Satan can touch it. So Father, we ask that we will not be deceived in any manner, putting our trust and hope in anything in this world, but put our trust in thee. Well, Lord, we pray that whatever it is that's keeping our, our eyes glued to this world, help us to let go and let God then Lord, you can do whatever it is that needs to be done to save us into your eternal kingdom. This is our prayer in Jesus' worthy name. Let the church say, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Southern Worship Center church service by way of YouTube. And I would like to invite you to uh, come back again at the same time for more spiritually uh, food to be served out by way of All Arlington Southern Worship Center. And now I pray, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen and amen. God be with you until we can meet again. Goodbye. Um.